right, 84 slides. Everybody ready? Ready? No? Okay. That's what we're going to do. That was the first version. That's right. Then we'll go to number two and three. <laughs> Corporate deck. Ready? No. All right, we're going to get going here, guys. Thank you, everybody, for jumping in here. How has CypherCon been so far? Not too bad? Pretty tolerable? Right? Might it show up again, right? Yeah. I went to the video game thing last night and had a blast. That was just old school JDM equipment. So we are going to move as fast as we can because it's a 30-minute slot. We're going to be respectful of the next presenters. My name is Chris Sears. I'm an endpoint. endpoint. I'm a security engineer, and I cover about 87 different products that, we, that Checkpoint sells. This is Chris Richard. You see what his title is right there? This is Brian Nielsen. Um, we've been with Checkpoint for a long time. We're very proud to be here today, and what we're doing today is unprecedented in terms of uh, Checkpoint presentations. So let's get into it. Here's the agenda, very important. Every single bullet point matters, especially in the corporate world. Uh, Self-description. What is this campaign? This campaign, so far as my engineers who developed this entire campaign have told me is, uh, an operator's gonna come up, push a button, bad stuff's gonna happen, and we all get rich. That's what I've been told. You. Uh, see, I could have swore, yeah, see, I could have swore they asked me for a Bitcoin address and I made that mistake. We're gonna get this thing rolling then. Let's do it. All right, so we drew a name and Ashley, come on up. Or you can be right there, yep. And then, so what we're gonna do is, uh, here, I'll give you this one here, buddy. And I'll pop down there. So All right, so you won. Uh, name and school, and what specific like direction you want to roll with in security? Um, my name is Ashley Tung. I am a data science major, and I go to the University of Wisconsin Madison. So data science, and then your friend? Oh, hi. I'm Anna. I also go to the University of Wisconsin Madison, and I am a console major. Good. So one thing that at Checkpoint we do, and I'll be real quick about this, is that we we have a whole thing called Secure Academy. We support students. The next generation of security professionals are currently students today. Um, we also partner a lot with women in cybersecurity. So you'll see at any one of our events, we will be working very closely with those organizations going forward. So with that, Brian, do you want to go ahead and explain what sort of a mess we're going to make today? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. So, and I'm actually going to slow it down just a little bit because that timer on that screen is very, very important. That is when that big red button goes live. Anybody can come up here, smash that button. It's not going to work yet. So, uh, that button will start working in 330 seconds. So, we'll slow down just a little bit. But, I want to actually pull back the curtain just a little bit to tell you guys what it is we're actually doing, what we've developed. So, this is a custom developed implant, which is going to act as a piece of ransomware on 20 different hosts that we've infected, right? Now, you're going to see on this screen over here, after uh, the big red button is pushed, you're going to actually see that switch over to two remote desktop sessions that you know we're actually going to watch what's happening. So here's the deal. The two desktop, remote desktop sessions. One of them, we have Microsoft Defender ATP. We're not here to bash Microsoft Defender. That's, that's not what we're here to do. What we're here to do is talk about the story, primarily managed detection and response, and how that all integrates together with a good uh, security platform and ecosystem. The other one you will see will be our own endpoint security tool called Harmony Endpoint. Uh, so you'll see those both side by side. We'll actually see the encryption happen. We'll see any response from either of the hosts. So we'll actually have a lot of fun with that. So what we've developed here, we have nine different stages of operation in our implant. So this first stage, right, this is to initialize. What I've done here is I've said, okay, well, I need to set some things appropriately on the system so I can actually operate, right? I want to make sure it's a good, clean environment to be able to operate my implant on. Next, we go into the profiling. Now, there's a lot that happens here. High level, what I do is I collect a lot of system information. I collect a lot of user information. I also make sure that the environment is safe for my implant to be able to operate in. What I mean by that, I go and I try to determine if this is an analysis environment. So if it is running within a virtual environment, if I can actually look at what the input uh, signatures are and identify if this is something that is you know, some kind of pattern that is not some human-derived interaction with the system. So we go through all that. And if all that's working, then we get on to this very important thing right here. Right? So we've developed this thing. This is great. But it wouldn't be so great if it got out. 
right? We don't want this to, to end up getting out. Now, uh, suffice to say, uh, there are limitations inside the code that we've developed here. So the first one is it does not have a lateral movement mechanism, and that is by design. We don't want this you know, going anywhere we don't want it to. The other part here is the kill switching. And that basically looks at everything that's operating within that environment and says, hey, uh, is, you know, is it actually okay to operate here? We look to make sure that we have the right artifacts within that system. Otherwise, it won't continue to work. Then we're gonna generate our implant ID. This is actually very important uh, because we need to keep track of what we have infected, right? We have to keep track of that. All of this is managed by a command and control server. Then we go right from there into registration with the command and control server. Again, we have the capability to come in here and just say, hey, just kill it right now, but we've already gotten to this point. We're you know, registered with the command and control server. We're down here a little ways. After we've successfully registered with the command and control server, we get into my, my favorite part. This is the file system enumeration. You'd think that you know, actually encrypting the files or you know, making fun of the user, that would be fun, but this I really like. So what we're doing here is we're actually targeting specifically, in this case, just user space. And we're gaining a giant file tree of everything that is within scope there. So I'm building an entire file tree. But then, I wanna make sure that I'm actually targeting just relevant files. So I get rid of directories, I get rid of links, you know, things like that. Um, then I'm going to say, all right, well, I only want files that are of certain size. In our case, we're looking at files that are just 10K to 13 meg, right? So I'm not looking to target things that, you know, would be massively huge. They're probably not super impactful anyway. So I scope that down. Then I say, hey, I just wanna target specific file types. So we do all that, and then finally, I get down to doing something that is actually really kind of fun here, and it's honeypot file avoidance. So one of the big things that we see endpoint security tools do is lay down honeypot files throughout the file system. And if those are messed with in any way, it starts to raise some alarms and raise some triggers, right? Well, this particular implant actually goes and removes those from its target list because Let's face it, most vendors out there, even us, right, what do we do? We go and we say, all right, we're gonna create honeypot files and we give them predictable programmatic names. Guess what? Those are easy to find and easy to avoid. So what we end up with is, hey, we've had 9,000 files in the beginning and all the way at the end, we actually have 73 files that we are actually going to encrypt. This is where we are today. We're actually in this loop of requesting tasking from the command and control server. And as you can see, we're coming down there to the point where we can actually hit that button. Then we're going to go ahead and do encryption. And then finally, we're going to get into actually mocking the user. So again, this is where we are today and I'll pass it on over to Chris so we can actually have some fun here. So big picture, um, one thing that was confusing to me for a long time because I wasn't a coder is the require the requesting tasks. That's literally the infected hosts sitting there going, hey, can I go, can I go, can I go? Well, now we can go. So your turn, you guys come on over and hit the button. And then what you're gonna see is, uh, I'm gonna switch the monitors pretty quickly and what you'll end up seeing is our actual RDP session. So go ahead and hit it, girls. And okay, so now what we have just done is we have told the C2 that it's good to go. Um, oh, uh, stick around after the show here, girls. But as a thank you, we wanted to give you this. So this is a custom made laser engraved Yeti. Um, let's have a round of applause for our volunteer. Really appreciate them coming up. She's like, I'm scared, I don't wanna be up here. Um, the guys with big black Suburbans, they're probably gonna be meeting you afterwards. And thanks for the plausible deniability, we don't have to worry about that. Go ahead and have a seat, girls. Yep, yep, but you're on a list. Congratulations. If you're in cybersecurity and you're not on a list, you're not doing it right. So now we're on to, this is the RDP sessions. These are gonna be hanging on the background while Chris does some more explanations of uh, what we're gonna be seeing here. Okay, so ideally what should happen, although Brian reminds me constantly that anything could happen, 
Uh, ideally, what we should see happen is we should see uh, Harmony endpoint detected, so we should see the splash screen for ransomware come up here shortly. Uh, we should see um, uh, ATP uh, end up getting known, and we'll see the uh, uh, splash screen up there for the ransom note. So hopefully in a perfect world, uh, we'll be able to get it stopped. What we'll do is we'll send all that information up to Horizon. So that's our MDR platform. Brian's gonna cover a little bit more of that later. Um, you guys can come down uh, to the booth after to be able to get a little bit more information on the full uh, attack chain there. And just to touch a little bit, although you stole my thunder with the honeypot files, um, just to touch a little bit on you know, kind of how things work, right? What, how we're detecting different types of things. So one of the things is volume shadow copy, right? So a lot of companies use that as a mechanism for file restoration. So one of the things that most ransomware does, although we didn't do it in this case, is the ability to, to disable that and then clear it out. Of course, Brian already touched a little bit on the honeypot files, right? So those generally rank higher. So as soon as we touch them, we start to trigger alarms and alerts on it. Um, file extension modification. So this is something that I kind of learned uh, more recently uh, is that if we don't modify file extensions, it doesn't raise as many alarms. So a lot of times you'll see ransomware change that file extension. That's a good tip uh, to the solution that they need to start addressing it. And then for us, um, I think one of the most important things is Checkpoint is a uh, trust nothing, verify everything. So a lot of the other solutions, they have a little bit of inherent trust. So if Microsoft trusts the process, then it too should trust it in anything below that. Checkpoint is a little bit differently. Uh, we analyze everything. So regardless of whether it's a trusted process or not, we're gonna inspect everything, which is one of the reasons we're able to, uh, to catch things. A Couple of the other things, um, we are not relying on volume shadow copy. Uh, we do have a uh, custom folder that's uh, on the root of C. Uh, we lock that down uh, to the endpoint agent itself. That is our mechanism for file restoration. So as encryption starts to occur, we move files to that folder, and then at the end of the attack, we end up restoring them back to where they were. And then lastly, uh, we do do a little bit of ranking. So we look at different occurrences on the machine, so different things that are happening, like volume cap, shadow copy deletion, uh, touching honeypot files, uh, and a variety of other things, in which we hit a threshold and we trigger it. So with that, I'm gonna give this back to Brian, because at the end of the day, it's more about man detection response, although I would love to steal all these thunder. Well, you can if you want. You're walking away with that. Yeah, I'm there you go. All right, so uh, obviously, you know, the endpoint that is a crucial component here, right? So we are infecting an environment that has endpoint security, Microsoft Defender ATP on one, and Harmony endpoint on the other. And uh, what we're hoping to see, right? Uh, Chris would be really, really happy, right, if everything uh, worked out and we see our Harmony endpoint go ahead and catch it. That's gonna be really cool. Uh, I will admit I am torn. Well, I'm here to talk about that managed detection and response today. And yes, that is a linchpin in our process of being able to send something over to MDR. I mean, I wrote the thing. I'd kind of like to see it succeed, right? Uh, but we'll see what happens. So on that note of managed detection and response. So Checkpoint, we are involved in a lot of different things. A lot of people know us as the firewall company, right? So back in, good Lord, 30 years ago this year, we actually uh, incorporated ourselves and our big claim to fame was the fact that our founder and still CEO, Gil Schwed, invented the stateful inspection firewall. So we have a very long pedigree and we still do network security firewalls and gateways today, but that's not you know, everything that we do. We're in cloud security, we're obviously in endpoint security, user protection, secure access service edge. Um, However, we are also in this space of security operations. And that's where our managed detection and response platform really comes to play. Now, I'm not going to beat you guys over the head with a lot of, oh, hey, here's our managed detection and response platform. This is really cool. Go out and buy it. No. But here's the deal. We, as security practitioners, we've been through this game time and time again, right? And we. You know, we see breaches happen, we see this, and we see vendors come in and say, hey, this is a really cool solution, this will stop it. And 
oftentimes it doesn't. It's broken promises all the time. So let's actually break this down and talk about what an MDR solution is, a true managed detection and response solution. So in our view, right, what should be included in a true MDR solution? Well, first of all, not just one vector. We see many, many vendors out there who say that they have MDR solutions, and what do they say? They say, oh, well, we work with the endpoint. Okay, we, what else do you work with? Do you check email? Do you have visibility on the network? Do you look in the cloud environment? No, 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 well, we believe that that's not enough, right? So that is our philosophy, and we'll get into that a little bit more. We also believe that things should be a true MDR platform should be both vendor agnostic and then holistic and full service. What we mean by that is we should be able to go and basically follow this entire stack, give you coverage for everything, and then full service from the perspective of we should never have an MDR offering that sees something happen and then just says, oh, hey, look, I found something. Good luck. Speaking of which, it worked. Hey, all right. <laughs> We're totally not sweating it over here, for real. <laughs> yeah, we I was watching We definitely are not looking at the face. command and control in the back end going, son of a bitch. Yeah, yeah it, it was quite fun all right, uh, from this on. vantage point. We'll, we'll, we'll describe more of this in just a moment. All right, so now, all right, that was a little bit boring. Okay, thank you. I was kind of you know, stalling myself to make sure that that was all going to happen. All right, so now we're really going to get into it. All right, so what is Checkpoint's philosophy when it comes to MDR, right? So I said that, you know, when we talk about this, we're talking about every single vector, right? We want to be able to cover every single vector for you. But we also believe that an MDR solution should be these five core tenants. Simple, tailored, comprehensive, collaborative, and vendor agnostic. We talked about vendor agnostic. We also believe that there should be a life cycle to everything that we do a simple security operations life cycle, right? Now, Checkpoint, we've said for years, we are a prevention first company, right? And honestly, if you look at the real marketing material for our managed detection and response service, it is managed detection slash managed prevention and response. I hate that name, right? Because that makes no sense. If you're doing managed detection and response, you're already past the point of prevention. So we just don't even talk about that. Uh, don't let this get, this get back to our marketing folks at Checkpoint. Um, hey Brian, real quick, Brian. So it looks like actually the restoration continued too. Absolutely. So that's yeah. awesome. <laughs> so we see that there's this life cycle here going all, starting with prevention, right? And then we're going to monitor, detect, investigate, respond, hunt, and then we're going to you know, cycle through that all over again. So what does that look like in the Checkpoint ecosystem? Right, we have Horizon MDR. And just like we were talking about the cyclical process, this is what we have developed. Right, and we were talking about this concept of, you know, this repeatable process, this cycle, a rinse, lather, repeat, right? And this is what we do. And this is, this is pointing to the fact that, you know, MDR ultimately should be a foundational component, right? We shouldn't be going and saying, hey, you know what, MDR is just a bolt-on. It's just a nice good to have. It should be a foundational component of your security operations platform. So when we talk about that, right, we say, well, there's your security stack. And yes, we leverage your security stack, but the MDR solution should be that foundational component to your security stack, where we have complete or as complete as possible visibility to be able to do security operations on your behalf. Of course, what is that next level, right? So we deserve to continue to move forward, right? So I had a very, uh, very good friend and mentor of mine who pulled me aside one day, and he said, Brian, he goes, who do you think has the easier job? He goes, and by the way, we're, we're working for uh, CIA's cyber defense organization at the time. He goes, Brian, who do you think has the easier job? Do you think it's you know, us, and we're, we're charged with defending all these networks, that's great. Or, do you think it's the bad guys? And I looked at him, I said, well, you know, uh, my job's really hard, <laughs> right? And he goes, well, yeah, he goes, but overall, he goes, it's, it's the bad guys. He goes, you see, they only have to be right once, and, and they're gonna win, 
right? And at that level, the stakes are insane. Uh, but he goes, we, we have to be right every single time or we lose, right? So we deserve to continue to drive this industry and drive advancements in technology, not just because it's a cool thing to do, but because the bad guys are doing it too, right? So we have to stay on par with them. So what are the next things that we really need to account for? This you know, concept of enrichment, intelligence, building in AI, ML, and deep learning, uh, going through and uh, accounting for aggregation and correlation like you'd find in a traditional seam, but also building in automation that you're starting to see with SOAR platforms. Right, and what's that next level, right? We wanna get there. Hopefully that's not lost on, on many people. Uh, but, right, that is ultimately what we are bringing to bear in the true foundation of every single technology here at Checkpoint, which is the threat cloud, right? Every single one of these capabilities, from being able to provide intelligence and enrichment, intelligence-driven enrichment, AI functionality, doing real-time real inline aggregation and correlation and automation, all of that is purpose-built into the solution from threat cloud. Now, threat cloud, it's this crazy, crazy thing. It's a, I could do an hour on threat cloud alone, but just take this for example. 83 different data lakes make up the Checkpoint Threat Cloud today, and that consists of 86 billion daily transactions coming into the Threat Cloud. Quick question. Anybody have an idea how much, <clears throat> excuse me, how many transactions Google averages per day? Just ballpark? 5.7 to 5.8 billion per day. So, so how many do we have again? 86 billion 86 per day. billion and transactions a day. A lot of you probably heard of this down in the booth there. That's broken down across 150,000 networks that we operate in, from the largest nations to small nations to SMBs, across 100,000 different customers. So scale matters here. It really does. And it ties back into what you were saying about the, the depth of it. It's not just the endpoint. Yes. It's everything. It's mobile devices. It's cloud. It's everything. So that's, that's the size of the threat cloud or the data lake that you're walking in makes a difference. Absolutely. So how does that all kind of look in terms of MDR? Bringing this back to MDR, what do we do? What is our life cycle, right? That's, that's actually important. If you're gonna talk to somebody about MDR, you need to understand their life cycle. So we're going to get events from your security stack, and all of this is actually API driven. We have some exceptions in there for instances where a product doesn't actually have a usable API, but we prefer to go via API with your security stack. That gives us a lot of agility and you a lot of control. Now we pull all that data into the MDR platform, which actually has a purpose-built uh, system behind it that accounts for all these things that we were just talking about. We have our customer dashboard, we have our analysts that are constantly on it, and of course, live inline enrichment through the threat cloud. I know it looks like it's off the top there, but it is a inline process that occurs before these things even reach the analyst at checkpoint. And that's what we have for you guys. Any questions? Yeah, Open we're, discussion. Time. We're gonna start tearing it down as we go because we want to respect our next vendor, but seriously, what do you guys think? Not too bad? You saw what happened up here on the screen, right? Awesome. Um, congratulations, Brian. I'm expecting a nice dinner after you getting paid for that. Um, what questions do we got? Well, my boys are breaking it down. What questions do you guys have about this? Has, have you guys seen a live ransomware launch that actually worked? Thank God. Um, anybody seen those before? Yeah, go ahead. So the question was about um, what different levels of, of incident response do you basically have? So at Checkpoint, depending on the size of the organization, it's the same team, right? Uh, diamond customers, customers that are at the, the paying the highest level, they get a certain uh, SLA, four hours, whatever it is. Our customers that are SMB customers, that, that might be really small customers, they still are working with that team. They have that level of response. And again, the size of the customer doesn't matter to us. They have access to their portal. They can see the interaction. They can see the alerts. I have a bank in Central South Dakota with 28 customer, or 28 employees. They have the exact same level of support and response times as 3M. That's the difference between us and a lot of other organizations. Thanks for the question. Any other questions you guys on that?
Great question. So what's that split between IRT, Checkpoint to IRT, and um, working with the on-prem team? It is actually completely up to the endpoint, uh, the end user, the customer. Some organizations are like, no, 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 no. I got two and a half people. They're dealing with a bunch of other garbage. I ain't got time for it. Checkpoint, you have access to everything. Go nuts. The other side of it, with typically larger organizations, they're like, okay, let us know. There's a chain of command. There's a process. Playbooks. Please tell me you guys have all done some playbooking. Um, how do we exercise those? Tabletop exercises. Do them. So many people have not, or so many organizations have not respectfully done a tabletop exercise. You know, they looked at it on a whiteboard and they're like, that'll work. Next thing you know, something hits a fan and oh crap, where'd that book go? So the way that we try to do it is with each and every customer, our, our MDR team, our IRT team, um, they work with that customer and say, hey, how do you want to do, how do you envision this? And if we've had this happen where customers will be like, you just email us, we'll handle it all. Okay, we're emailing you because it probably didn't get handled the first time. Maybe we want to do a little more than that, if you know what I mean. But we always try to customize it based on what the needs of that organization are. Again, great question. Thank you. How are we looking, boys? We're pretty much good. We can get out of the way here pretty quick for those guys. Okay. Um, we, you guys know where our table is. Hard to miss us. We're giving away an Atari. If you haven't signed up, I don't know why. You have problems. Thank you, Christina. I mean, let's be honest. That makes it more awesome. <laughs> so, go ahead. that we had available today uh, in this presentation, we weren't able to show the MDR side, what the MDR analysts see, what the customers see. But if you come down to the booth, we're going to continue to track this event through. Uh, and we actually have one of our MDR analysts here today who will actually help talk through this whole process. We'll actually have the uh, customer portal uh, available for uh, everybody to look at, interact with as well. Awesome, thanks, Ryan. Okay, so thanks everybody. Hope you guys have a great one. Come on down, check us out. We'll talk to you guys soon.